We're under the covers on Afternoons. You're a woman, you want social themes, believable characters. You, you want plot, suspense. The strange story of the flowers had never been reported in the press. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Come, we shall walk together. I can honestly say it's one of the most enjoyable periods of my life. (laughs) Under the Covers. Every week in Under the Covers, we look at the life of some interesting character through the books that might have influenced them, that may have changed them in some way, because a a good book can do that to you. It can change the way you think. And I guess this week began his varied career as a busker with the Doug Anthony All-Stars. He's a painter, an author, a filmmaker and a songwriter. And you may know him as the host of shows like The Big Gig, Good News Week and Strictly Dancing. He's in Perth at the Astor Theatre in Mount Lawley on the 31st of August. He joins us on Afternoons now. He's Paul McDermott. So nice to have you with us. Hello, Gillian. Lovely to be here. Can we talk about Mm. books and your early life? Were you a big reader? Uh, I certainly was when I was younger. I I loved reading. I was told at one stage by an ophthalmologist that that I could have uh, caused myself uh, an early onset of of blindness because of my desire to read Undercovers at Night uh, by Moonlight. And I think he tried to scare me to stop me reading by saying that... uh, you know, I was damaging my eyes terribly. So um, from an early point in my existence, I, books instilled a great fear in me. What sort of thing did you read then? Beagles to comic books to, um, you know, a boy's own adventure books, anything really. I could, uh, Henry Treese, I think, was a guy that wrote Viking stories that were strangely illustrated, and I like the illustrations in them. I've always been attracted to illustrations. Dictionaries, uh, pictorial dictionaries. I used what to what like did you like at. about those? Oh, I like the images. I like the the the, um, the engravings that they would have in them a lot. Yeah, for, uh, pretty sort of varied. I've always had a, an attraction to illustrative illustrative texts. Because you are a painter, aren't you? I mean, we know you as a, a cheeky, sassy <laughs> TV host, yes. but uh, but you are actually yes. quite a deep thinker, and you love to paint. Well, I don't know if I'm a deep thinker, but I certainly do like to to daub and uh, and mix mix paint up. Mm. And do and do scribbles. I like scribbling. What kind of home did you grow up in? Were you were you in terms of I mean, were you surrounded by books? Were your parents big readers? Uh, my father was certainly uh, sort of read a lot. Mum, with uh, six children under the age of seven, didn't get much of a chance to do anything apart from rear us, which was fantastic. Great old girl, though. You know, it was a happy it was a happy existence in Canberra. It wasn't a um, you know an academic or scholarly house. Was school a positive or a negative experience for you? In terms oh, I hated of... school. It it may have more to do with the institution than um, you know that I went to rather than the actual. Um, I, I I came to knowledge a bit late in life, if that makes sense. Yeah, like I'm... the idea of knowledge is an attractive thing. But I did go through a, a, the Catholic education system at um, Morris College in Canberra, and um, didn't really take to it. it. wasn't the right material. It wasn't in the first. It wasn't in the first eleven or anything of that nature. It can really it can it can squash you, can't it? It can squash oh, yeah. you the love of learning out of you. Yeah, no, I I became more and more insular every year, I think. As maybe as a form of protection, I'm not quite sure. And then uh I felt like every year was a descent into hell, you know, going down one step uh with each year that passed. And uh and could see yeah, virtually by the end of school absolutely no hope for myself in the um in the outer world, also because uh, because of my you know the early the blindness that I was told about that would mm. engulf me by the age of twenty eight, and also by a dentist I was told um, because I had pneumonia as a as an infant that uh, I would lose all the teeth in my head uh, by the time I was in my mid twenties. So I, I was looking forward to a future of of blindness and um, toothless blindness. Uh, not much of a catch, basically. Did th- did that happen? Can I ask how are your no, teeth? No, my teeth didn't. My teeth are still hanging in there, uh, which is good. Um, but uh, and now my eyes are my eyes are really going now. But I'm at that age where your eyes tend to go. So, but <laughs> yes, they've always been pretty bad though. The eyes uh, for those people who know about eyes. Mine, I'm a I'm a negative seven or negative six point five. Um, but I'm I'm now losing my um uh, my close up sight as well. So I'm in between worlds, as it were, with the vision, which is interesting for the the painting and things of that nature because mm. you suddenly lose. I'm oscillating all the time between looking at a canvas just with you know the naked eye or slotting my glasses on, moving backwards and forwards, trying to get the, the optimum distance from uh, an object to be able to read it properly. Under the Covers. 
on Afternoons. Paul McDermott is our guest in uh, Talking Books in Under the Covers on Afternoons. And you talk about uh, that, you know, descent into hell with, with school. And I think a lot of people can, can relate to that. And that can either, as you say, just, you know, squash every every joy of, of learning and reading out of you. Or, or you can, particularly if you are an insular sort of person, it can then that can be your escape. Which mm. was that for you? When I left school, I went to art school in Canberra, and that was like a that was I suppose the first time I felt my heart was beating. I felt there was a a place, a world beyond, you know, different ideas, and I embraced those and um, and had uh, had great teachers at that at that school, which uh, gave me faith once again in the idea of learning. And that's a time, um, particularly when you're a teenager, because we, we can be a bit angsty, we can be really open to new ideas, we can come across a particular author or a series of books that they, they can change the way you think. Was there anyone or, or uh, anything that did that for you? The, a book that certainly changed me, I think that, yeah, that would be the, the words, would be a book by a guy called Jerry Rubin, who was the leader of the Yippie movement, which were the Jewish hippies. And it was a book called uh, Do It. Scenarios of the Revolution. I don't know if anyone remembers Jerry Rubin these days, but it was uh, it was a book from um, Dalton's Bookstore in Canberra. It was in the fifty cent bin out the front, and it was on uh, it was all red, as I remember, um, on on sort of photocopied paper, made really cheaply, and it was about all the money I had. So you know, if you're interested in in subversion, just make it cheap and accessible. And accessible, yeah, make it cheap and accessible, and the kids will get it. But that was that was a crazy book full of like very uh, hippie hippie attitudes with a political edge. It sort of shocked me when I was about I think fourteen. I think I, I purchased that book. And very different to what being brought up a, a Catholic boy and uh, reading the Bible. Very a, a very big change of things. Diligently, you know, yeah, diligently, <laughs> yeah, reading the Bible. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it it certainly gave you a di- different aspect. There was a there was a great snap of it of uh, of uh, in the middle of this book of you know nudists printed red on white paper. And over the genitals of um, each of the nudists, it had one vote, which sort of drove home the point that, you know, anyone, anyone, regardless of your interests, has the right to, to vote. So a lot of like political messages all the way through it about the way that uh, people power and change and so on. Did that steer you or, or how did you move then into the particularly um, the career path that you, that you chose? I didn't really choose it. It sort of cho- chose me. When I was at art school, I, I really needed some money for my last year of, uh, of art school to do my final year piece. And I'd, I'd been for three years basically scribbling in a corner, doing tiny, tiny drawings, very small drawings on tiny pieces of paper. And I can't express to you how small these drawings were. They were really small. And I thought um, that for my last, you know, my last piece at the school, I should do something monumental. And I was also a bit inspired by Mexican muralist painters at the time. To, to do this major piece that I'd conceived, I needed to get canvas. So I sort of I needed money, uh, which, which led me, to me teaming up with uh, Tim and Richard uh, from the All Stars because they busked and uh, made about $30 each in Garima Place in Canberra on a Saturday morning. And that was enough to get me some canvas. So it was, uh, you know, very, very um, sort of mercantile demands on me that uh, that forced me into that, and then the all stars sort of took off. And you you fit into that quite well. You seem to fit into that quite well. Yeah, surprisingly, I I thought it was a better fit for me than um, what most other people had to do when they were going through art school, which was um, uh, wait tables or you know uh, work in the the back end of a restaurant. I I didn't see myself as uh, much of a people person and that would mean having to relate to people whereas for some some reason actually performing you you're quite distant from from people which was good (laughs) we're under the covers on afternoons i had the all-stars book which was a really a very weirdly shamosly sort of book with lots of drawings in it a lot we were doing lots of cartoon images at the time i remember so that was that was a weird book um and it was weirdly published because the Everything had been written on the road uh, while we were touring. No one even ran a spell check over it. Uh, I'd written everything I remember longhand and handed it to someone who was employed at the office to type it out. And then that manuscript, without even us seeing it, was given to the Allen and Unwin people. And then they they printed it with, <laughs> without running a spell check over it. <laughs> they trusted uh, you. <laughs> well, they didn't, I don't know what they did. I think it was just, you know, it was one of those market, got to get this on the market by this date. Uh, so it didn't really matter about... Um, some of the quibbles you might have as a writer, like seeing the galleys or anything of that nature before the damn thing actually comes out. So that was a weird experience. And, and then I wrote columns for the newspaper, for various newspapers for, 
for a number of years, which I really enjoyed that process. I loved the the process of um, you know writing short pieces about um, certain things. The forgetting of wisdom that was yeah. that was fun. That one. What yeah. what author has influenced you most as a writer? Ian McEwan. I've always I've always found his work pretty interesting. From the from First Love Last Rites, I think, which was his first book of short stories. So I've always had a you know interest in in his work. Mervyn Peake. I really loved just for the excessiveness of it. I liked Victorian writing when I was a kid uh, as well. I came across Edgar Allan Poe, I think, on reading sheets they used to have. They used to have reading reading sheets in uh, the school I was in. So I must have only been um, in first grade or second grade, but came across Edgar Allan Poe and a cask of a Montillado, which is about a fella getting walled up inside a wall. So good stuff, you know, a little kid to read. But gave me, you know, I loved I loved uh, horror stories and and dark tales. When I was a uh, when I was young, have you always just just read what you what you wanted to read? Just random things that you're you're attracted to? Yeah, oh, yeah. Sometimes just book covers. A book cover can attract me. <laughs> I like that idea that you you stumble across something for just the the beauty that that someone else has brought to it. Sometimes things are recommended, but uh, normally I'll uh, in regards to reading, I'll try and source things that I I'm particularly interested in. You seem an incredibly visual person for for somebody who has has trouble with their their eyes. I know it's mad, isn't it? I sing, but I I'm not I I don't know anything about music. You've had a quite a lucky career, haven't you? Because oh, you just ridiculous. Sort of stumbled <laughs> from one thing, you just happened to be good at them, and people happened to like that the, well, at the same time. This is what this is why I wonder now, late in life, what would have happened if I'd actually applied myself to anything, <laughs> rather than just being you know a vagabond wastrel, you know, flipping around like a cork on the waves and just allowing things to happen. If I'd actually taken control at any point of my life, I wonder what marvels, what marvels I could have created. Or what disasters that could or what have gone disasters. horribly wrong. What hell I could have pitched everyone into. It's just been one of those things. Uh, an aptitude, you know, happily adaptable aptitude for, for most things, I think. With uh, with Good News Week, that must have been because I mean, because you wrote songs for that, you wrote uh, headlines for it. I don't know how many mm. newspapers you read a day, but it all sort of would happen very fast and then disappear into the ether, mm. and then happen all over. Uh, happen all, all over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on a weekly on a weekly turnaround, it was quite insane. I mean, a great show, and um, I think sadly missed uh, certainly by myself, people that worked on it, and also as a forum to get young sort of performers and uh, and you know writers. Um, politicians, anybody on to discuss in a, in a satirical way the, the week's events. And also to get, um, and I, I don't mean to sound incredibly earnest, I'm not sure how to say it without sounding earnest, but also to just to get, you know, young, young people that I- interested in news, in what was happening, because it was just such a nice way to do it, engaging way well, to do it. It was, it was very popular. When, when it was on the ABC, I think on Friday nights, uh, when it first started, it was certainly a show that... Uh, a lot of parents were watching with their their older children. You know, it was, it was something that brought uh, the family together. And I remember how, how important that was, I think, when I was growing up as well, to have a number of shows that you sat around with your, your parents and, and watched. I've got a series of, of quick questions for you just to, mm. to finish off. Is there is there one book that you would keep if you could just keep one? Oh, this, you've got me on the spot now. Would you go Maybe back to Jerry like... Rubin? Yeah, go back to Jerry Rubin. Good old Jerry. Do you know Jerry Rubin? I have not read the oh. Do It. I haven't read Do It, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> oh, uh, Jerry Rubin was great. He did a number of like profoundly interesting, I, I thought, sort of uh, political events. And one thing they did was they, they marched on the stock exchange uh, in New York, he and his yippie friends who were Jewish hippies, uh, politically motivated hippies. And they got, uh, they got all the money they could. They got it changed into $1 bills. This is why they put the glass barriers up in the stock exchange um, for the spectator section. And uh, they went in there and they just, uh, at, at some point during the trading, they started throwing the dollar bills out over the, over the stock market floor. And all the traders uh, stopped doing what they were doing, which was probably moving quantities of millions of dollars, and started grabbing at the, the $1 bills, which was making a sort of a statement about you know, capitalism and so on. Uh, profoundly, but very simply. Is there a book, if you could um, inflict your, your will on the population of Australian school children, that you would put on the high school curriculum, if you could? Blood Meridian. I love Blood Meridian. That's a corker. That'd make them wake up. Modern Methods of Amputation. I like that one. <laughs> it's got some nice illustrations in it. <laughs> what do you read for fun? For some reason, I'm visiting China, uh, science fiction again uh, late in life, which I haven't done for a long, long time. So uh, China... Mielville, um, I think I'm, I'm ducking into him a bit. The City in the City, I really enjoyed. Just a number of uh, different things. I'm, I was ducking back into Mervyn Peake recently, Cormac McCarthy, going through his sort of back 
back catalogue of works. For fun. For fun. Lord. Yeah, no, I tend to write, read difficult books. But he's, he's so beautifully lyrical. It can have you weeping and, um, and, and joyous in a single line that you have to read over and over again just to get the full meaning of it. He makes me wish, he makes me think I do not know how I could live another day knowing that such misery exists in oh, the world. That's, it's good to finish him, isn't it? Get yeah. to that last page. Oh, God. Thank God that's over. Drenched in sweat, sitting there. <laughs> oh, what about um, a, a book you'd want you, your children to read? Or you've just, have you just got the one? Oh, yeah, just this, the, the one boy. Well, I mean, the, you know, where the wild things are is something that was um, was very, uh, you know, wonderful when I was young. Th- that infiltrated my dreams as well because I used to have a dream about a forest growing in the in the bedroom that I think I thought for many years was my own dream and how I would wander through this, uh, you know, this forest that was in the was in the room with me. And it was only I think when I when I looked at uh, where the wild things are again that I thought, oh, maybe that's where that particular dream came from. <laughs> but certainly that's a, a, a you know once again a beautifully illustrated book. And I, I'd certainly love dark and gothic fairy tales. You know, the darker, the more hideous, the more horrible, the better. I think we're in a very sort of, uh, you know, either a primary colour or pastel world when it comes to children now, and everything's got to be um, soft-edged and bouncy and, and wonderful and and wiggles, wigglesy, wiggles-esque or something. But I, I don't know, I really, I used to love the darkness when I was a kid. It would be remiss not to have those things in the in the library. Is there a book you'd ban? No. No, I don't. I don't think I would. That, you know, that you're about one step away from burning when you talk about banning, and that that puts a you know that's a nasty sort of taste. You mentioned um, the pe- previous people had uh, suggested Nigella Lawson cookbooks or Jamie Oliver, which I found prof- I do find it profoundly disturbing that we are assailed now at every media source with the tales of chefs and how they uh, put carrots together or something. I, I just find the whole uh, superstar chefdom thing quite insulting for all the for all the mothers out there <laughs> they've probably spent their entire lives over over hot saucepans cooking for enormous families i wouldn't ban them i think you know it's, it's if you want to read them but they certainly they certainly they pump the market along for some god knows why i don't know why they're certainly up there aren't they they're very popular cookbooks. i think it's the i think it's the pictures it's the pictures is it? i don't know out of all the things you could put in a book image wise pictures of food it just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I'm baffled. I'm baffled by cookbooks. Have we asked you to pick a song to finish off with. Have oh, you... look, I've picked a really long song just to annoy you. Great. Is that bad? It's a, a song called Siberian Breaks by MGMT. And I like it because it's just got so many different moods in it. And it's also a, a pastiche of, of different styles of song. Uh, there's a little, there's a couple of references in there to people like Leonard Cohen and classic.